So what we're going to talk about today are patients with complex needs. I want to just start by saying, you know, I can't imagine anybody waking up one morning and saying, my life goal is to become a patient with complex chronic pain. That's what I want to become. Um, I can't imagine anybody ever doing that. The other thing I want to just re reiterate is I want to go back to the first session where we covered some readings about the science of chronic pain um, and just reiterate that chronic pain is a, um, a dis-ease. Nobody with chronic pain is at ease. Um, it, is a, um, it is a pathology. Um, we know that it's a disorder of the, of the nervous system. Um, we know that it is something the nervous system has, has changed. So the nervous system, all of our nervous systems are, are what we call plastic, meaning they can be remodeled and reshaped like a lump of clay. Um, and, and patients with chronic pain have a, um, uh, a pathology within the nervous system that, that the good news is that they can re, re, rewire their nervous system. Um, there are things they can do um, to change um, the way their body processes signals um, that are interpreted as, as pain. Um, so um, these patients with complex needs, um, that needs to be kept in mind with these patients more, uh, I, think, I think more than, than, than anything else. So we'll cover the philosophy behind this building block. We'll talk about uh, commonly prioritized activities. We'll talk about resources, um, how you as a, a QI facilitator can support uh, clinics in doing this work. So as I said, chronic pain can be complicated by other conditions. It's, in fact, it's, it's rare that someone has chronic pain um, without some degree of um, coexisting other uh, conditions, um, usually mental behavioral health conditions that can interfere with your, your uh, efforts to help them and with their efforts um, to, to self-manage um, their chronic pain. Um, just as a reminder, um, uh, many patients who've been on long-term opioids develop opioid use disorder. Um, it's been estimated in multiple studies that 15 to 20% of patients who are on opioids long-term for chronic pain will develop opioid use disorder. For them, opioids are the wrong medication. Just want to reiterate that um, and have you think about that just for a minute. I think identifying additional and appropriate resources for these patients and creating systems and workflows in your clinics to connect patients to these resources is absolutely essential. And as we discussed a few minutes ago, it's not just making the referral, it's closing the loop and making sure the patient is accessing those resources. Um, you may find that some of these resources might be developed or brought in-house within a, within a clinic setting. Others you'll need to identify in the local community and establish um, linkages and, and connections to them um, and agreements with those who provide those resources. So there's actually a relationship between you and those who are, who are um, a resource for the patient. So what do clinics do? What are, what are commonly prioritized activities that clinics do? Um, first, clinics often perceive the need to identify and integrate um, tools, uh, screening tools, um, and processes to not only identify complex patients, such as those with a behavioral health disorder or opioid use disorder, but also to make that diagnosis. You know, half of all patients with an opioid use disorder go unrecognized, and half of those who are recognized do not end up in treatment. Um, so it's not just the screening, it's the workflows to make sure patients are getting the appropriate care. Um, clinics develop, often develop clear referral pathways for complex patients and ways to close the loop on those referrals. 
Um, and if not already in place, many clinics have said, you know, we really need to consider how we're going to provide opioid use disorder treatment within our clinic. Because many patients, we hear story after story of patients who say, well, if you can't provide it, um, it must not be very important and I don't need it. So I don't need to go somewhere else for this. They want to receive their, their management and their care in their medical home, which is their primary care clinic setting. So one good idea that we saw is a clinic had a clinician who was providing medication for opioid use disorder. And that clinician offered to review the data that was being collected on all their patients who were on long-term opioids and perhaps look for indicators or signs and do some case reviews of patients who might need additional screening to recognize and diagnose opioid use disorder. Um, so that's just one example of an activity one clinic did. There are some resources, um, again, on the clinic resources page that you saw in the last presentation. Um, there is a resource that we think is um, really helpful to think through if you're gonna develop a, a medication for opioid use disorder program in your clinic um, about considerations for how to redesign systems in your clinic to be able to do that. Um, and it's called Developing a Buprenorphine Treatment Program for Opioid Use Disorder in Primary Care. Um, there's another resource about stigma, especially specifically around opioid use disorder. Because again, no one with chronic pain who started on opioids gets up one morning and says, my goal in life is to develop an opioid use disorder. Um, it is difficult for us sometimes not to use stigmatizing language with patients who have an opioid use disorder. Um, for example, <clears throat> um, there are resources about language um, that we use around opioid use disorder, um, what we used to say and what we should be saying. Um, it's a way of, of respecting patients and a way of, of of bringing them in and saying, we want to be a partner with you in managing um, this condition for you. Um, and there's some guiding principles for addressing stigma about um, um, opioid use disorder. And finally, there's a resource about tele telehealth and chronic pain management. We developed it for COVID-19 a year ago when, when the pandemic hit, and we all went to doing telehealth visits. <clears throat> but it's just a common sense guide about how to do um, telehealth visits for your patients with chronic pain. Good, because I think although the pandemic is going away, I think telehealth may be here to stay um, for some of our patients. So what can you do as a QI um, support or as a practice facilitator? Um, you know, you can be that, that boundary spanner to connect clinics and providers to programs such as the University of Washington's telepain program. That program is open to anybody in the United States. It is not Washington State specific. There may be other resources in your state. The University of Kentucky uh, may have a similar program, for example. The um, University of Kentucky may have uh, telemental health resources for your state that you can connect patients to um, if you don't have the resources in the local community um, to make referrals of patients. They may have ways you can do a warm handoff of patients to a mental health provider that's doing telehealth. Um, we saw one um, clinic in West Virginia, for example, that had a warm handoff system to a telemental health program at the University of West Virginia. Um, and they had a program set up where one afternoon a week, um, there was a nurse care manager who did the case presentation and did a warm handoff of a patient uh, to a mental health provider. Um, which was all remote, done by telehealth. Um, and encourage at least one provider in your clinic to present a complex patient to that tele, telepain team. So the UW, UW telepain program has a way of you submitting a complex, complicated case, and they will discuss the case. Um, and it's in a HIPAA-protected environment. Um, and, and discuss some of the aspects of that case and make some recommendations for you about managing that complicated patient. Um, other ways that you can support this as a QI um, or a facilitator um, is to go over the clinic policies 
that a clinic has written with the opioid improvement team, that's what OIT stands for, um, and ensure that they provide clear guidance on when to refer complex patients, what those referral pathways look like, and how to close the loop on those referrals. So you can be another set of eyes. Um, I, I know that oftentimes when I'm developing resources and tools, um, um, I can't see the forest for the trees, and it helps to have an outside set of eyes um, who can review those policies and say, oh, you know, here's a way you could make this more clear. Um, here's a way you could be more specific um, about the guidance in this policy. Um, here are some thoughts and ideas about ways to improve them. So be that extra set of eyes, be that backboard for the opioid improvement team to bounce ideas off of when they're revising policies about complex patients. And you can also, as, a, as an external set of eyes, help them write workflows that are very clear about how you are going to screen patients who are on long-term opioids for these coexisting mental health disorders. Um, what are the ways you can, what are some pragmatic, practical ways? Because there are things that you should be screening for. You should be screening for depression. You, you should be screening for PTSD. You should be screening um, uh, for other mental health conditions. How do you do that? Who's responsible for that? When does it get done? How does it get done? What do you do with the results of those screening tools? Who, who reviews them? Who interprets them? Um, who is, whose responsibility is it to develop a care management plan for patients who screen positive, right? Um, and make sure the workflows are in place to do that. Um, you can also help them identify, you can be that, that scout. You can go out and say, what mental health behavioral resources might there be in your state, in your region, especially telehealth options that I just mentioned. Help them find those resources um, and connect them to those resources. And then finally, you can help them think about different approaches for risk stratifying your patients um, and facilitate a conversation really across you know, your, your health system. You have a health system with multiple clinics um, and, and have a facilitated discussion across those clinics about how to identify high-risk patients, medium-risk patients, or low-risk patients. Who's at highest risk of having an adverse outcome from being on long-term opioids? Who's, and who has complex, in terms of, as a result of their complex um, multimorbidity um, and coexisting mental health um, uh, behavioral health uh, conditions and develop approaches to risk stratifying your patients because that will help guide the, the clinic in saying, oh, we need to see you again in three months or we need to see you again in six months or we need to see you again in one month based on your risk level um, and facilitate a discussion across the clinics about what do we all agree on as a way we want to risk stratify this patient population and what works best for them. As, as discussed in the last segment, I would really encourage you to look at the resources about having these challenging conversations with patients, um, uh, about especially those who are on um, higher dose opioids, about getting their opioids down to a dose level um, that is safe. It's not about discontinuing opioids. That's not what this six building blocks work is about, although there's some patients who, who will do fine if you discontinue their opioids with time, but it's about getting their opioid dose down to a level that is safe. And again, I just emphasize all of this work is about patient safety um, and making sure patients um, don't have an adverse um, event. Um, for example, you may have a patient who's been on chronic opioid therapy, long-term opioid therapy for 20 plus years. They started when they were 50 and they're now 70 and their dose has not been changed in that 20 plus years. But we know that as you age, your physiology changes, and that dose may no longer be safe for you at 70 than it, as it was in 50, and it may need to be tapered for that 70 year old. So how do you have that conversation? Um, I would strongly urge you to check out the Provider Clinical Support System um, resource. There's a webpage for this 
Um, this, organ, this program, the Provider Clinical Support System, it's supported by SAMHSA. There are some real good resources there, especially if you're thinking about um, uh, beginning a medication for opioid use disorder program. Um, they can actually help providers find a mentor, someone who's had experience doing this and connecting someone to a mentor um, for, for, for using their X waiver um, to prescribe buprenorphine. Um, and then again, there is a resource for establishing an, MOU, an MOUD program in your clinic. And just as a facilitator and QI person, bring that resource back to the table for the team to review. And just one final word again about telehealth. Um, <clears throat> there may be patients for whom telehealth is actually more appropriate. Um, I've had conversations with many providers especially who provide care for older patients who are on opioids, who said the telehealth visit was a godsend because they were able to see the patient in their home environment and do a video visit with them in their home environment. And that did two things. One, they discovered the patient was much more relaxed and their affect was much improved compared to when they saw them in the clinic. And they went, huh, why would that be? Oh, perhaps coming into a clinical setting reactivates their PTSD because they have chronic pain because of a severe traumatic motor vehicle accident. And they were in the hospital for many months and coming back into a medical setting reactivates their PTSD. Oh, no wonder the home visit when I see them, it looks like they're doing much better than what I thought they were doing. They have PTSD and I didn't know that. So developing telehealth visit workflows and scripts for conducting these, these visits and ways of screening for these conditions using telehealth. Um, another thing you can do in preparing for telehealth visits is making sure that everyone has staff, uh, everyone on the staff has some training and whether it's telehealth or in person, has training in psychological first aid, how to have conversations with patients who are in emotional distress. Um, this, the telehealth visits also help you think about how can we identify which of our patients are at very high risk, have difficulty coming to see us because they have to drive a long distance to come see us because we're in a rural area. Maybe we should offer them telehealth visits and that will improve their no-show rate they will be more likely to visit with us via telehealth than in person and then proactively reach out to them. And then rehearse and prepare for these mental health conversations during these telehealth visits. Think about what, what kinds of things do you want to visit with a patient? Kind of rehearse those visits. Use some of the scripts that are available in the, in the, in the clinic resources um, that are available on the website. Um, <clears throat> and finally, we talked about in the last segment about, <clears throat> about alternative therapies, non-pharmacologic therapies. Um, there are some amazing resources for doing virtual, virtual physical therapy visits. There have been multiple studies documenting that virtual physical therapy visits um, are, are effective, as are telemental health visits. We know they are equally effective as in-person visits. <clears throat> so explore those options for alternative therapy, whether it's, whether it's a physical therapy visit or uh, mental behavioral health visits or other non-pharmacologic resources, such as um, yoga, um, such as mindfulness visits and other resources. 